Namaste and good afternoon to one and all. I am Mirali Mehta. And I am Varsha. And we extend a warm welcome to everyone on behalf of the BK Majumdar Institute of Business Administration to the much awaited annual national meet, Concourse 2013. Concourse started in the year 2002 with a view to provide an interactive platform to students. However, since last five years, the reach of this event has widened. And this year, again, we have invited participants from various disciplines like commerce, liberal studies, engineering, and law. Concourse assures bringing the best minds with the best of the ideas at the best of play. With the participation of over 27 undergraduate and postgraduate colleges from various parts of India, Concourse has grown bigger and better with every passing year. If art is to nourish the roots of our culture, then the society must set the artist free on his vision wherever it takes him. So with this thought, we present before you the theme of Concourse 2013, that is Culture and Development. Can we have a huge round of applause for this very idea of culture development for a management team? How unencompassive and relevant it is. <laughs> At BKMITF, we began every event with a thematic invocation for which I would like to request our student volunteers to come forward and then learn an invocation. Oh, 
but the institute will refrain from lifting the trophy. The process about this um, theme of concourse is what I would like to share with you for a couple of minutes. Last year our theme was uh, rural development, a must for India's inclusive growth. And the deliberations and the ideas that came out at the end of those two and a half days led us to this theme for 2013. We realized that a lot of growth or otherwise that was being talked about by the eminent panelists, the judges, the expert speakers who came at that meet. Figured, we figured out that the growth or otherwise was rooted in culture. This year, we therefore decided this as our theme. The interest in economic growth is a post-Second World War phenomenon. In initial years, the attention was focused on savings and investment. That too, only in the physical assets. As our understanding in factors affecting growth deepened, the role of social infrastructure began to be appreciated, especially of law and order, enforcement of contractual obligations, and political stability. The recognition of culture as a shaping influence came to be recognized much later. This coincided with broader understanding of culture thanks to the development of anthropological insights. Our understanding of culture now encompasses all the inherited paradigms affecting our life. Early Western thinkers talked about the beneficial impact of Protestant influence on world culture. Hindu culture was wrongly perceived as a restrictive influence on account of its supposedly other world fixation. It is now recognized that culture has a far more pervasive influence. Not only it shapes attitudes, it is a powerful influence, but it affects both production, consumption, and lifestyle. It enriches and embellishes the communities and provides a powerful assertion of identity and militates against cultural homogenization. If it affects hardcore economic activities, as the recent trends in the inbound tourism indicate, the tourists now seek a glimpse of cultural lifestyle to treasure their experience. Apart from the economic dimensions, it is now accepted that culture is one of the strong mechanisms ensuring the just and fair use of natural resources for sustainable development. As the evidence of countries such as UK and US shows, creating immigrants have enriched the host country by adding more spice and color to their cultural mosaic. Food, clothing, festivities, thus bringing about a better understanding and tolerance of diversity. The study of culture is now explored as a positive factor to be harnessed to unlock the creativity and potential of different ethnic groups and foster the understanding of tribes. It is in this context, ladies and gentlemen, that we zero in on the theme of concourse as culture and development. To enable the larger student fraternity understand and appreciate the nuances and the role of culture in development we have today with us. A panel of eminent experts to lead the discussion and show the way forward to the budding enthusiastic change makers of the future. My sincere thanks 
to the eminent panelists for being with us today. May I now request our student representatives please offer them a floral welcome. Dr. Rita Kothari, We would also like to extend a warm welcome to our other esteemed guests, Dr. Carlo Provost from the Park University. We are grateful to you, sir, for sparing you and I. Institute of Commerce, <laughs> Director Patrick, Director HRCP, <laughs> we are grateful to the authorities and management of Ahmedabad University for their support and encouragement. Our thanks to the principals, directors of sister institutes on campus heads of programs, executives, and faculty members of Ahmedabad University for their presence and good wishes. I'm happy to applaud the student body, faculty, and staff of PKMIDA for planning, organizing, mobilizing resources, and efficiently managing this entire event. I wish all the participants the very best in their competition and hope they enjoy these two days of intellectually stimulating and exciting events. May the best win. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. I now request Professor Chirag Trivedi, the, the mentor professor in charge for Chronicles 2013, to introduce this year's eminent eminent panelists and also take us to the lecture. session of this management meet, as we realize that the discussion is certainly more counterproductive and is more close to real life situations. And on this theme, as Ma'am has just talked about, of culture and development, the kind of panelists we have got today, I think it is one of the special achievements of this year's concourse already back. Our first expert panelist is Dr. Rita Kothari. I particularly feel very happy while going on with this task. That it's a special moment and it's important for me to mention that she's my teacher and mentor. Dr. Rita Kothari is currently Associate Professor in the Humanities Department at Indian Institute of Technology, Gandhinagar. She has been an associate professor and then the professor at Madhra Institute of Communications, Ahmedabad. She is a prodigious author, translator, and a social scientist. While wondering how will I be able to introduce or give introduction to the students about Vita Man, I just thought that I would probably mention the titles of the books she has authored, and they will speak for themselves. She has authored books like Translating India, The Cultural Politics of English, 
translation of Gujarati novel Angarya, The Step Child, as it is titled in English. Speech and Silence, Literary Journeys by Gujarati Women through Gujarati Short Stories. Unbordered Memories, a collection of short stories translated from Sindhi to English. Modern Gujarati Poetry, which is a collection of Gujarati poetry translated into English. And it tells us that along with her keen interest in translation works, she has also been involved in understanding cultural trends, the designs created by literary as well as socio-political moves and movements on the tapestry of culture. And therefore, some of the titles of her later books are like The Burden of Refuge, Sin Yusra Partition. It's a book that traces the Sindhi community's journey from Sindh to Gujarat. Decentering Translation Studies, India and Beyond, which is the extra volume of essays that contain reflections on translation practices and theory in Asian societies. Chapter 5 English, I'm sure the title would interest the students, the phenomenon of English and memories and movements. It's a book on borders and communities in one week. Touch. Dr. Rita Kukwari has to credit more than 20 journal articles and 20 book chapters. She has been invited as a speaker at Goa Arts and Literary Festival. Festival. She has also acted on the jury of the Economist Prosper Award for Indian Fiction in English Translation. She has been a Bhupen and Shruti Shah Chair Professor and she has been a resident scholar at the Leisure Rockefeller Center, research fellow at Indian Institute of Advanced Studies, Shimla, and a, a Fulbright scholar. Above all, I know Rita Ma'am is a passionate teacher and a hardcore critic and researcher. And that makes an excellent combination of an academic of a standard that she sets for herself. Let me request the audience to put their hands together for Dr. Rita Kothari and for the students who will offer a minute of a token of our heartfelt gratitude. Our next expert panelist is Sri Kartikeya Sarabhai. Padmashri Kartikeya Sarabhai is the founder director of the Center for Environment Education, which is headquartered in Ahmedabad with 40 offices across India. He is also the chairman of the Ambala Sarabha Enterprises. He is closely involved in the activities of the Nehru Foundation for Development, Pixar, and different Sarabha Community Center, Community Science Center. Sir Sarabha is also a trustee for the Savarmati Ashram Preservation and Memorial Trust and the Physical Research Laboratory, as known as PRL. So Sarabhan has served on many committees set up by the Ministry of Environment and Forests and Ministry of Human Resource Development for the Government of India, primarily focusing on the greening of India's formal education system, and also by his initiatives for biodiversity education. He is a member of the Earth Charter International Council. He was also part of the delegations which represented India at the Earth Summits. He is currently Vice Chair of the Indian National Commission for the International Union for Conservation of Nature. He also led the first international conference on the UN Decade of Education for Sustainable Development in Ahmedabad in the year 2005. And he is a member of the UNESCO Reference Group for the same the ESP. Sir so Sarabhai has also been the editor of the Journal of Education for Sustainable Development published by SAGE. And he has been the recipient of Tree of Learning Award from the IUCN. The Indian Institute of Human Rights has presented him with the World Human Rights Promotion Award. And as I just said in the beginning, he received Padmashri for his phenomenal contribution to environment education in India in the year 2012. In fact, the wide range of Sir Kartike Sarabhai's domains of expertise runs from sustainable development, environmental policy, environmental awareness and impact assessment 
natural resource management, environmental management systems, to con conservation issues, climate change, biodiversity, carbon footprinting, ecology, and community development. We wouldn't have a better panelist than him on this theme, therefore, for this discussion today, I'm sure you all would agree. Now, I request our student volunteer. And the third expert panelist at Converse 2013's inaugural function is Mr. Rabbi Mangandas. Mr. Rabbi Mangandas is an MSc in mass communication with specialization in computer graphics from Boston University. But what makes him an inspiring panelist today is the fact that he is a promising entrepreneur, one who has by staying deeply rooted in the cultural ethos, written an admirable success story in business. He is the founder of the house of MG, a heritage hotel in Amdaban. He is also the convener of INDAC, Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage, Amdaban chapter. This is a national level organization that works for architectural heritage, crafts and communities, conservation training and capacity building, heritage documentation, heritage education, heritage tourism, and cultural development. His interests are innovation, design, technology, and development of social sectors. Mr. Rabbi Mangaldas is also the managing trustee of Freya's Foundation, an educational institution based on philosophies of Montessori, Tagore, and Gandhi. Where this institution runs a school, museums, theatres, and thereby enables next generation of India to become more culturally sensitive, inclusive, and growth oriented. Thanks a lot, sir, for gracing the audio function, and I request our student volunteer to present. Before we move on to the panel discussion, I'm sure which is long awaited, I would request all the three eminent panelists, with provost of the University, Dr. Carlo, and Dean of and Song Dr. Bhavesh Patel, with the director of the Institute of Sri Tivedi, Sir Sri Yavati Patel, and Sir Sri Jaya Patel, to please light the lamp and inaugurate on 1st 2013, the annual national management week hosted by VKMIT. Now request the panelists to please come and take the seats on the dais. I would also request Dr. Rita Kothari to initiate and then moderate the panel discussion when needed, along with certainly sharing her insights as the expert panelist. And dear members in the audience, let us all tune in, let us all be all tears.
the dual role here of being a panelist and also being a moderator. So really speaking, I'm implicitly performing another role, which is, which is, which is that of a guide or a supervisor. So I'm here because my student Chirag will sit here and give up. This this subject, I think, uh, I'm going to really lay it down. Uh, a very interesting and productive kind of a background and an opportunity for bring us from courses to the ones today and showed us where the rules of this particular thing lie. And which is which is which is a kind of a realization that culture is not simply a dressing, it's not simply a spa, a little garnish in the world of business, in the world of economy, but that culture provides the foundation out of which economies Culture shapes the way we see economies. Culture shapes the way we see development. We know how loaded a term culture is. It comes with us. It comes to us with many other attendant concepts, and they also need to be taken into account because you can't talk about culture in isolation without talking about a certain cultural politics, a representation, a legitimacy, a history, tradition and changes that take place in traditions. While we acknowledge the loadedness of the term culture, we seldom acknowledge that development is also not a new term. Development is also an extremely loaded, biased term, and which also raises questions of whose development, at whose cost, whose price, geared to whom, aiming at what. I'm hoping that we would be able to raise both of these questions in time of each other. The, the interesting ways by which this institution has brought these two together, especially in the context of management, is indeed laudable. My own experience of being an institution of management has been that you, you would have a cultural basket. They would hire people like us. And we would be teaching classes on communities and history. And then there would be separate classes on development, then separate classes on management, then separate ones on technology. So you might have a humanity student coming out exactly untouched, completely untouched by what went down in those other classes. And similarly, those other students who go to development and who go to classes on management and economic growth, they may come to a class on say, okay, Rita Mab is doing some culture, culture, movie happening. And then I go, why don't you up and tell you, and you might, you might find evidence of this in my, in my talk today, that one of the titles of my books is called Justifying English. So I will keep resorting to some amount of English. I think it's particularly uh, relevant for students to know that just as culture is not static, languages are also not static. They evolve, they change, uh, they acquire new terms, and they become new avatars every now and then. Anyway, so coming back to this question of you know, you would find very often management students, and I have taught myself, of course, in this very room on culture. And uh, it's almost as if there's, there's a kind of a little spa, you know, going on there. It's kind of easy, uh, it's nice, it's different, it's not like doing the case study. So let's just go and attend a class on culture. But what do the two have to say to each other? More importantly, how do the two negotiate, confront, and collaborate with each other? I'm hoping that the course of the panel discussion, we would be able to bring the two together and not merely posit them as antithetical categories as they very often are assumed to be. But what, what, what would make sense to say today? Uh, you know, given a short time, given how complex these definitions, how unconsensual we are about what would be, really speaking, the right definition of culture for it. My mind sort of went back to an episode of Khan Banega Karodpati, which I watched a couple of weeks ago. I generally don't watch it ever since Amita began to play really bad flow. And Khan Banega Karodpati, I stopped watching it. I think he looks like a magician. But a couple of weeks ago, I happened to chance upon an episode when at the beginning of Kaun Manega Karopati, you know when he gives out those really simple, easy questions, yeah, when he's uh, selecting his team or whatever, and one of the questions which was thrown to 
the audience was uh, those jumbled up categories. So he gives these jumbled up categories and you're quickly supposed to like the rapid fire now, you're supposed to arrange them in sequence. And the question was, these jumbled up categories were more arrange the sequence in an Indian wedding. And the categories were Mendi, Vinay, Varmala, Fene, Isterase, some four or five things like that, and plan when people and arrange them, and some got it right, and some didn't get it right. And he comes up to the stage and very sort of uh, charmingly, sagely, he, he says, Yeah, what that is, Hindustan Vishaji. And the matter is sorted, and his candidate has been selected, and all of that. But really speaking, the question, which we don't pause to ask, is this Vishaji thing? Which wedding is being represented here? When you say this is what happens in an Indian wedding, whom is he speaking to? Which tribal wedding, which Dalit wedding, which wedding in the Northeast would have the Mendi, the PT, the Fere? So very often these questions of culture come with their own brands of homogeneity. They include some, they exclude some, and they do a very systematic job in India of constantly excluding several communities. Almost in this completely right manner saying, oh, but this is what happens in India. This is what Indian culture is about. So my job, really speaking, both as a teacher, as a researcher, as someone who engages with people, with books, with communities, with students, is to, is, is, is to have this critical eye. And to see, hey, wait a minute, what are we talking about? Is culture static? Is it, are the images of incredible India, a little Kuchipuri here, and a Bharatanatyam there, and the Madhulaya temple, and the Rameshwaram, and Taj Mahal, is, is it assemblage of icons, is what we call culture. What happens to culture which belongs to people? And by which I don't mean only folk. Because I think folk also comes with its own problems. You know, the moment you talk about folk culture, you imagine this republic parade, which Nehru started way back in his days, right? The Tarane Tarno Medo and what have you. I prefer to use the word look. What happens to cultures which are of everything? Cultures which are mundane, which are invisible, which are intangible, which are not easily available to the eye. But once that means something to people, once that they continue to live with, and I think therefore it is important to sort of take our attention away from cultures which are not merely out there in performance, but also ones which are intangibly, invisibly, at a very, very quiet subterranean level, making their presence felt, at least for those to whom they matter. And in the process these days of translating a Gujarati novel called Bahar, which is written by this woman, Ila Rameta. And you've got a character there who's a Muslim woman who's grown up in one of the villages in Saurashtra. She comes to the city of Ahmedabad, Baroda, something she's teaching. And one of the students walks up to her and she likes this. This is a problem. I mean, she, you know, she's a Muslim. The student goes to this teacher and says, Madam, come here, Chandra, Kari, Lord, and Fatima, Mani, And she says to the student that would I not be acceptable by being Fatima? Cultures are also about legitimacy. Cultures are also about acceptance, about living with differences and not ironing them out and not straightening them because they become little capsules that, that can be consumed. Cultures need to be left, needs to be lived with no matter how uncomfortable. So everything about culture is not a museum It is not, it's not always pleasant to the eye. There are also differences which are somewhat difficult to live with. But we still got to live with them because that is that is what being culture is about. It is about being able to uh, I want to rest my case here for a moment and come back later uh, after my you know I've got I've got here the movers and shakers. And I think they will have much more to say on this subject than I would. Because after all, I'm an academic. All I can do is to add qualifications, what we generally say. You know, it's a cliche. People talk about academics talking too much. I've just realized why that is the case. 
I don't think it has to do with the proverbial belt or whatever. Because I don't have a belt where I reach now. And yet I do it because I think we are just we just constantly adding qualifications. So if I want to say, oh women in India have emancipated and free, I have to add about ten other qualifications to say why that is true. It's not true of rural India, but it might be true of a certain class, but it is not, but it might be true of a certain caste, but then it is not of another caste, and so on and so forth. So I think I will I will come back with these issues whenever I see qualifications are not being made. I might bounce. Uh, but for the moment, I think let's turn our attention to Padmashri Kartike Sarapane. Thank you. 
them. And as long as you don't see that, your ministry will always be at a bridge. It can never be at the center of, of, uh, of the whole development process. But you will yourself don't see it. At the same time, this is in a catalog between, between it just uh, coming up three months, but really showed the sort of potential of what, what this is. And, and it was a time that we were recruiting, I see. So we had 5,000 applications coming in, and we were, we were tests. So one of the tests I see, which I gave was for each each of the applicants uh, to say what in their surroundings was uh, something which was part of their intangible cultural heritage, which they think needed some some effort to preserve or to preserve. And it was interesting that people really understood that. Uh, for instance, many people said that the joint family was the cultural part they would like to see. And they talk about family and how the family works and the whole relationship. And, and some of that is in, in language, uh, as they have said. Um, for instance, we have very specific names in most Indian languages. We have very specific names for every type of uncle and type of aunt. And, you know, we, we have to be, all those relationships are, are there. But it's interesting that we generally don't have the word for cousin. We do not want to distinguish between your brother and sister and your cousin. And, and we have, in my house, I have the boys in their region. And, and uh, Sina, who is a American, she was asked, what is that word? And I said, we don't have that word. Because in case we don't use that word if we have it. Uh, we still treat them like uh, brothers and sisters. So that, that is also how sometimes culture gets into language. Language is a reflection of, of culture. Uh, how, how that works. And of course, as she said, one of the things you really discover in India is that just about any statement you make is only true for limited, uh, I mean, means, 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 that, that way. But we were looking at, at culture and sustainability in this. And where does this, where does this come in? And people are saying, what's the value of, value of some of these, and value of this culture? And I said, uh, when I came back at the school, after completing the work, I joined the, some work with the Protein Food Association. And they, they were doing research on how much protein you get in vegetarian food through lectures and through rice and through other food. And usually the way they would do it is they would take each one and then they would add it up. And you found that the absorbed protein was maybe not so good. And someone had the idea that suppose you use lentil and rice together and you do the experiment together on a separate and suddenly you found that the absorbed protein is way up. And now the way the research was done, it was done separately. And, and when I came in, it was to basically tell people that three kidneys and number and that. And the same amount of protein is two glasses of milk. Now that happens because of this, this combination between two and the fact that we cook it together in many ways. Uh, now that is increasing the protein intake. So I asked the question, I said, if someone had to go to the prime minister and said, I have a way in which I can increase the protein intake in the entire population by X percentage, what would, and without adding any new raw material, the same raw material, how much would that be worth? It would be worth thousands of rupees. That is what we have just by doing how to be Dokla or English or Chili or anything else. That is part of our, of our food in our, our culture. We have a number of instances which we found in agriculture. Agriculture is again not seen as culture. Not only does it have to work, but agriculture has a number of traditions. This time we are looking at what's marine traditions in India. And marine traditions in India you find in the service. They have very clear period in which they will not go fishing. This is a time when the fishes are spawning and nothing. Now they are talking about creating a campaign to let people know because they are forgetting the traditions. And, and, and the problem here is that there is so much in our tradition which is seen as, as something old, seen as, seen as something which is not development, and some of leaving those traditions and going somewhere else and becoming in many ways less. Is seen as 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 development, and I think one of the biggest challenges for for, for the type of of course the discussion which you are having is 
how do we get our mind free away from thinking of self in, in a way which is imitated from from others? And how do we see that there are great things in our culture and there are another? And then we need to bring together things and, and take it forward. And I want to think wrong also in our culture. Let's not also think just that our culture is everything is correct. I was told the story and I want to correct it. But from before many years ago when Saki was there, they come to
Then the age is slowly getting homogenized. Or what I like to call it become a McDonald's doctor. You know, it's a homogeneity. Everybody is trying to identify to, instead of trying to be dissimilar, they are seeking to be similar, so they belong. That's the tribe mentality. All of us don't want to stand out. We want to merge and we want to look similar to each other. So we find a lot of us wearing the same shirt and the same jeans and the same trousers and of course different particularly. <coughs> but that is, uh, except of course during Navaratri, but uh, that's become a costume. Now, in development and business, this presents a great opportunity. And uh, all the work that I'm doing, even in education actually, is to try and understand whether the culture that we are adopting just because it is something that has been touched on us by media or by Bollywood is what is right for us. That's the question I think all of us should ask. And the second one is that how do I make this an opportunity for me, the fact that so few of us understand the true meaning of what is unique about ourselves. And therefore from I'm trying to move culture from a group identity to an individual identity. I think uh, already Rita uh, touched upon this, uh, that it's an uh, individual culture. So, and it's slightly intangible, but one can say that it's related to our house, uh, what we follow in our homes, our customs in our house. Each of us, even if we are a particular community, we have some differences, particularly mentioned about decoration or about the significance of flowers. Uh, similarly, if we try and map the different cultures within this classroom, we have an amazingly wide tapestry, which essentially is an opportunity for business as far as I'm concerned. Let me elaborate why is it an opportunity for business. Uh, I, for example, have a culture in my house of eating on the terrace. This was a wonderful way of enjoying the weather and not having air conditioning and uh, enjoying the environment, which I thought very few other people were doing. And I couldn't understand why, because most of us have tennis. And I thought it was wonderful. Everybody who comes to my house seems to really enjoy it. Why don't I start a restaurant on the terrace and see what happens? And that's how we had we have a gash. And I think this example has repeated at the house of How many of you have been to the house of Oh, very few. I invite all the rest of you. 20% discount. <laughs> so this is another opportunity. Uh, so I would like to uh, share one or two more examples at the house of The other thing in my individual culture was to uh, use uh, the garden a lot, a lot of gardening and I thought that my familiarity was with Indian uh, flora and was much more than most people. So as the house of energy, instead of using or buying fancy art, expensive art, what we have done is use extensive plantation and this is in a whole city where you don't see um, any green spot. The house of Delhi is perhaps the greenest spot in Ahmedabad in that section, even though 80% of it is built up. So any open surface is green. Now you may say, what is planting to do with culture? It is, it is to do with my culture. It is to do with the way I was brought up. And I look at culture not as a group identity, I look at culture as how I have seen it, how I have related to it. What food I eat, what kind of clothes I wear. So it is, it is an evolving, uh, the work that I do is an evolving uh, uh, reflection of things around me. Let me uh, conclude about education. Education and this whole classroom concept is also very cultural. It was brought by the British. Even the time when there was no Tax, telegram, email. How could you do an uh, entire, uh, entire world sitting in London? 
Well, the British developed this concept where they train few people with a very specific way of imparting a very specific method of administration which they could do all over the world. This was the classroom concept. Education was never in a classroom in India. This has been completely wiped off our own culture and we have adopted this and we continue to do that. And now at the school that uh, I am at the opportunity of now uh, looking after that idea of education in a classroom is being challenged. Question, why should education be in a classroom where people are facing the people who are talking and then is that the best way to learn? Is this is writing down, taking notes, stage on the stage, formula the best way to impart education? Again, an opportunity by going back to what our culture is. So, I think that uh, all of you can find many such opportunities in Ayurveda, Yogasan, in uh, Pranayama, in, in, as business opportunities. And I can tell you that in crafts, the biggest business opportunity in their today lies in our culture. And all of us with very little capital can uh, take that opportunity by just studying a little bit about what interests us and make it into a, a thriving business opportunity and contribute to true development. of being able to learn an indigenous tradition or a craft or a practice into an opportunity of business. I'm not sure that's equally available to people. I'm not sure whether that cultural capital which you were able to mobilize into economic capital was possible because because you had an access to both, because your cultural capital was a capital which you were aware of. I think what also tends to happen in India, I'm talking about a very different spectrum here, only to be able to sort of show us that there is a more nuanced and variegated something happening out there. There is this particular community that I have worked with in the region of Bali, and this community is called Marha. And what they do is to they lacquer those wooden spoons. They put lacquer on wooden spoons. And I have been visiting the region for about five years. And each time I ask somebody, I said, I have no point left Someone would say Adivasi chair, someone would say Dalit chair, someone would say Sri chair, and I didn't know. And I began to work with them and ask them, a question which one shouldn't be asking really even as an anthropologist is to say that you celebrate Diwali and you celebrate Eid, but who are you? Almost implying that you've got to be one of the two. You can't be both. And one of them said to me that we do both. We are both we, we sometimes we are Hindu, sometimes we are Muslims. But increasingly educated people like you come to us. And they said, it's a dark for team, you know, you become, you either, you should be either this or that. You can't be both. And therefore, over a period of time, I have noticed how, even in order to do better, even in order to sell their now, the community has had to become a form, a community, a group, see its borders, convert either to Islam or say we are Hindus, and become a part of organization, become a part of census, to be able to sell their products. So sometimes the amount of disempowerment and dispossession is so severe and it begins at such a fundamental level that the kind of craft they came with was not available for them to turn it into a marketable commodity. Before that could happen, there were many other things that had to happen at a social, at a psychological level. Until some organizations like Khabib stepped forth and began to work with those communities at the level of livelihood. So, I think Amir wants to sort of, I said. 
said earlier that some of my job is to qualify. And here he wants to add this qualification. That while it is true that certain kinds of indigenous crafts and practices may provide an opportunity for business, I'm not sure if that opportunity is available. So I think what I can say is that on a theoretical level it is one thing, but every challenge is an opportunity. And yes, craftsmen today they are separated from markets in a broader sense, and therefore for the craftsmen today to have a, uh, a handmade product then at a high value is to make it. Which is why to remain a craftsman is challenge. But I also look at it as an opportunity. Every challenge is an opportunity. That's the basic panda of an entrepreneur. That you look at opportunities where there are challenges, and only then can you be an entrepreneur. And I see a new challenge in craft. I see a new challenge in making. Now look at yoga. I was talking about uh, Ayurveda and yoga. So there are two open source measures of knowledge who thought of patenting at that time. This is was given a different type of development. This has very much to do with the concept of development. I don't see development as an economic term at all. I see development as a completely uh, something to do with emotions, feelings, standard of life, quality of living. That is not related to economics. And a craftsman or a pillar in like a farmer is perhaps happier having less money than a person sitting in front of the computer all the time. So I am very in understanding what is development. And if we can have a simple idea that development is a state of mind rather than what kind of car you drive or what kind of clothes, of course it has something to do with access to healthcare and education, no doubt about it. But beyond that, what is development is to be questioned by all the
thing, how fantastic it is. Fantastic the one who's moving. Things are not close, and therefore there is a pain. But he said the soul was not so great. So he basically changed the soul, the body. He did exactly the same. Okay, now to him, that was the that was the evolution of this shoe. Then you go to Hockbay, and there's a shop which sells this. Right? And what they did was, they said that the one shoes, you know, uh, should be stitched. So they stitched it all up. It's like having a sari with a stitch. Now, the very quality of this, because the power of it, you have lost in, in the process. Now, they also think that they have improved the product. And, and the point is that you go into what are, what are some of the symbols and what is the true nature of that of that thing? It's the same as the issue, same issue which my mother faced, same issue with many other people. Then are you only hanging on to some outward look of it? Or is culture really really deeper? I have to give an example of when the plastic button went into the dark area. And he said the dark is always and said no, to shut our thing, we have a perfectly good system. But this seems to be a very nice new material. So they take the plastic part of this, it's all over the place, except for this new. Because they found that it was a beautiful, colorful decoration which doesn't get bad when you wash it. Same thing. So you have now t shirts with maybe uh, 100 buttons, 50 buttons around there. In all places except these, because they are perfectly happy with it. Now, that type of innovation in the life is where you get new materials, but you are not limited because nobody has taught you. Nobody has taught you that this is the right way of using a button, this is the wrong way of using it. So, so then new materials come in and they go in without the software, like without the thing. You, you have people accepting it. Many people, you know, when they come from abroad, they say, oh my, you know, Indian food is very important. It's chili and things, very good. Now, I don't know how many of you know, but to me, the last week, Gaba came, something like a little over 500 years ago, that he came to get pepper, because that was a spice place there, and he brought the chili from Central uh, Central Asia. And the chilies which you find in India, you can now you think it's absolutely part of our, our food. It's only 500 years or so old, but because it came in a way in which people didn't know exactly what it was, they innovate. And that innovation is going on going on all the time, innovation based. Language, as you say, is innovation based. Dress, innovation based. And this thing like this thing. And, and to some extent, that lack of self consciousness of using things and not being boxed in. Now, why do you use the word boxing? The last room. But that room, where you, you can sit outside and still see the room around you. Because the real boxing problem is in your mind. And, and, and how do we do education? It's not only really not boxed in. Button all over is 
in an unconscious way being extremely hybrid and interesting. And I think as Indians, we have always done that. There's, there's nothing new about it. Ramanujan has this really interesting article called, Is There an Indian Way of Thinking? And he says, you know, we carry a toolbox with us. Depending on what convenience it is, what we want to do, we take out a tool. If we want to, we take out a tool called tradition, and we will mobilize tradition in an argument. But then if we want to talk about change and modernity, then we will take out another tool called modernity. Because the Indians are extremely adept at taking these various tools with us. And I think it is, it is important, therefore, to see that we do not make culture synonymous with a certain kind of elusive notion of authenticity, which does not exist. And yet, what I have mentioned earlier in a more homogenized situation, you might want to rescue, retrieve, and I think Abrashi has certainly done that, you might want to rescue certain days of time, which have their value, which are interesting, which are sustainable. And they might, you might want to look at them and not see them as alternatives to the larger Venga story, but see that as your or own Venga story. You know, I've I, I been bristled when people very often use alternative medicine for things like homeopathy and allopathy. What is the assumption here for homeopathy and Ayurveda? What is the assumption here that allopathy is the norm and everything else is an alternative? Alternative sexual identity, alternative this, alternative that, there is a politics inherent in that kind of definition. So I think if we see those indigenous forms as the main story, not as alternative forms, and rescue them and retreat them, which, which my co panelists have been doing, then I think there are indeed very interesting opportunities of not only of business, but of also of creating a society that's more humane and creating a society and that's more consistent with what we are. And there are little things that, you know, that, that we need to watch out for. I was noticing today that an announcement about somebody's death, you know, amongst a, a family member on Facebook, and people, people say, I right? you, you say RIP, whatever, whoever is there, and we people press the button like, because Facebook doesn't have this like, or Facebook doesn't have what happens to practices of sharing grief and mourning and showing solidarity with somebody? How do you do that because technology has only given you this particular option? There are these everyday ways that which you say, is this consistent with what I am? Is this consistent with the way I have been brought up? That someone says my uncle is dead and I say like. What, what happens to our practices? Do they need to be given up so easily? Do we, do we not think really what is happening out here? So I think there are questions that need to be asked even about everyday forms of culture, not only about the occasional ones which have to do with wearing Shirwani or wearing a sari or you know, looking like some kind of character out of jail too. I think we need to become more sentient to the great and little tradition that characterize our everyday life. I think that at this point, it would be good for us to have some questions from the audience. When Amai asked earlier what is development, I noticed that no women spoke for some reason. So, Pratishtha, go <laughs> Your, 
what is your view on the changing culture of development in India and is it good or bad or how it I have very strong uh, views on this whole business of humanism because development there are more. Uh, what we are following is development based on GDP and it's completely going towards the model that has already made, uh, whether it's the American or Chinese. So I think that yes, you are right, development is associated with business or with government and which government means the bucket the, and the index of uh, measuring development is GDP. I haven't come across any other universally accepted uh, index of development, you know, and okay, put down as happiness, but what else could it be which every all of us could accept, you know, and find uh, comfort in. And in that, Indian idea of growth and small is beautiful. And this whole thing of not trying to scale because we are in a business school, again I'm using terms which are related to business, not trying to scale because scaling is considered irrelevant. Are those which we must ask, you know? And because if, if we try and link development with some idea of pleasure, any kind of family, good health, education, then it cannot be when you are, uh, technology is supposed to give you more, more pressure time, but it's not. Everybody is constantly on it, as we all know. So, there are many questions, there are no answers, but I think as a, as a educationist, these are the questions we need to ask how to think about it, not let them follow this path of scaling it, growth, and all that. And growth is development. That is perhaps I can buy a bicycle up and down, I can do it. I have a very small part. I don't need that. 